evening, good evening, good evening. Uh, as you guys have been following us late in the last three or four weeks, we have we with sponsorship with NWCP and Veterans Council Veterans. We are going to we are going to have a a for Black Christian Month. We're going to honor and interview African American veterans who made a significant contribution uh, to the military while they were serving. And if you guys have followed me, you are you should have seen first how we had um, Gunnery Sergeant Arjun McDade. He he was he was awarded the Navy Cross. He's only second African American to get the Navy Cross. And that was a very interesting uh, conversation. And then also we had to be, we met uh, Brigadier General Kerry Nero. Brigadier Char Kerry Nero is the first African-American nurse that was that achieved the rank of general in the reserves. Good night, everybody. Now, we're gonna, we're gonna bring on the Mumford Corp. Mumford, today we're gonna talk about the Mumford Point Marines. But before we do that, intro. <laughs> Marines. One of the things we got to talk about here is that if you guys, including myself, have not heard about the Mumford Point Marines, be be ready to be educated, educated on them because I know all we heard about in the past is always heard about the Tuskegee Airmen. That whenever we talk about uh, Black History Month, but there's a Mumford Point Marines, and I really want to introduce you introduce you to those guys tonight. But first, let me have a quick little uh, intro on the Mumford Point Marines. The Montford Point Marines have long been embedded in the concrete of Marine Corps history. The recognition they deserve for their sacrifices, though, has been a long time coming. The Corps' first black enlistees, known as the Montford Point Marines, faced years of racial bigotry and segregation during their enlistments. But, like all Marines, they overcame, proving themselves on both the battlefield and later in their civilian lives. Retired First Sergeant William McDowell is one of thousands who trained at the small, segregated North Carolina camp. I, I never saw so many raggedy, crazy, sweaty people in all my life in one spot. Uh, it was controlled mayhem. Seventy years after the first black recruit passed through the gates of Montford Point, McDowell's accepting the Congressional Gold Medal on behalf of almost 19,000 Marines who trained there between 1942 and 1949. It's awesome. I, I never expected in my lifetime to, for anything like this to happen. About 400 of the Montford Point Marines made the trip to attend the ceremony in Washington, D.C., bringing long due recognition to true trailblazers of civil rights and equality. These giants, the few, the proud, the Montford Point Marines. From Washington, I'm Lance Corporal John Tucker. So, so there you go. The Montford Point Marines, be ready to sit back, learn about the Montford Point Marines. And I tell you what, since you know, as you notice, I'm Army. So you know, what, what right do I have to do to talk about the Marines and the history? Uh, so but this particular point, we're gonna, I bring on my posse who will actually be the one that's going to talk about the Mumford Point Marines, and I'm just sit back and I'm ready to learn. So let me introduce my pilots, my posses. We have here uh, Joe Geter. Joe Geter was a past commander uh, for the Mumford Point Marines. He's now the president for the, uh, for the Philadelphia uh, chapter or branch in, in Philadelphia, and he's also in public relations. We also have George Gillis, who is the uh, chapter president for Florida and for, for Mumford Point Marines, as well as in Jacksonville. We have Rabinowitz Williams, who is the who is responsible for the Mumford Point Marines in the Hillsborough and Pinellas area, and we're gonna learn about from him. But and then kind of almost like the guy, the really reason why we're here is Eddie uh, Marine Eddie Pringle. Ed, Eddie is part of our my um, uh, NWCP 5130 Armed Services and Veteran Affairs Committee Chair. He's part of our committee, and he said to me, "What about the Mumford Point Marines? What about the Mumford Point Marines?" I said, okay, okay, Eddie, we're gonna do something. So that's how this really started. So I wanna, I wanna definitely want to uh, uh, thank Eddie uh, for um, bringing us up and helping us get with this great esteemed group out here, just out there trying to educate on the Americas out there. Some people may ask, you know, when it comes to Black History Month, why you wanna put race on it? I only see green, I only see whatever, right? Well, for me, what makes this country great is not the sameness, but the difference. That's what makes this country great. We got a lot of cultures that make up this great military 
and we need to talk about it and and, and, and explore it because again, I always surprised some people in the Marines don't know about Mother Port Marines. But again, this is not sit there and be divisive. This is about educating our the, the African American community and the other and the Marine community about the Mother Port Marines and what kind of legacy they let. And these guys here are going to bring forth to that. So, to no further ado, I will now turn you over to Joe Gita, who is the historian, and he can kind of lay it out about the Muffet Point Marines. How you doing there, Joe? Oh, real good, Tony. Thank you for having me today. Cool. Uh, first, I want to thank Eddie Pringle. Eddie Pringle is a Marine combat Marine in Vietnam. He's a part of the Philadelphia chapter of the Muffet Point Marines, and he's done some, some great things for us since he's been on board. Uh, I am a past national president of the Muffet Point Marine Association, and I've been teaching this history for 44 years this month. Uh, so I think I, you know, um, I have taught thousands and thousands of people about this history. But let's talk about blacks in the Marine Corps. Uh, when we start to talk about blacks in the United States Marine Corps, we can go all the way back to revolutionary times. We have documentation that uh, a half a dozen blacks or so served during the Revolutionary War. Now, what we don't know, did they serve uh, in the stead of their masters or instead of their masters, or did they serve on their own accord? Uh, we don't know that, but we do know blacks were in the Marine Corps for a short while during the Revolutionary War. Well, after the Revolutionary War, the Marine Corps made a conscious attempt to exclude blacks from serving in the Marine Corps. Uh, it wasn't until right before World War II in 1941 that Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President of the United States, signed an executive order. Executive Order 8802. And what this executive order did was to provide, was to prevent uh, discrimination in the Department of Defense, not specifically the Marine Corps, but what it did do was open up the Marine Corps to accept blacks. Uh, the Marine Corps was not ready to accept blacks. Uh, the commandant of the Marine Corps at the time, Thomas Holcomb, uh, made a statement on the record in front of reporters. This wasn't done in a back room, but he said if it was a choice, of 250,000 black Marines or 5,000 white Marines, I'd rather have the white Marines. Now you gotta remember, this is 1941. Uh, we're on the verge of World War II. Uh, you gotta be a special kind of um, a racist, and I'll call it like it is, uh, not to want to accept a quarter of a million troops before you go to battle. But going back to President Roosevelt's executive order, 8802, signed in June of 1941. It ordered the Marine Corps to start accepting blacks. Uh, the Marine Corps did not abide by this order for a whole year. The first black did not enlist in the Marine Corps to 1 June 1942. So the Marine Corps was scrambling when they were ordered to enlist blacks. The biggest question is, where do we send them? Do we send them to Marine Corps Recruit Depot San Diego out in California? Do we dare send them to Marine Corps Recruit Depot in Paris Island? Uh, we're not gonna send them to either. In the early 1940s, a sprawling base was being built in Jacksonville, North Carolina, called Camp Lejeune. And above that, aboard that base was a small piece of land at the time called Mumford Point. It was an old CCC World War I camp um, that they deeded over to the Marine Corps. So this camp, which was morphed into the word Mumford Point, M-O-N-T-F-O-R-D, Mumford Point, was the beginning of training for approximately 20,000 African-American men who went through there. Now, those first platoons that arrived there on 26 August 1942 did not find boot camp as we may know boot camp and all the branches of service. What they found was a wooded area with a few buildings that had long been abandoned. So those first recruits actually had to build their camp before they can start recruit training. So we call those first 10 platoons the mighty, the mighty platoons. Uh, this was in August of 1942. So and uh, when the training began, all the officers were white. All the non-commissioned officers were white. But after blacks went through that rigorous Marine Corps recruit training, what we call boot camp, in the spring of 1943, some of those Marines from those first platoons were trained as drill instructors. And they took over the training of the black Marine recruits. Now, many people may think it was going to be easier because blacks were training them now. People like... Gilbert Hatch, Mark Johnson, or Edgar R. Huff, or Davis, or Boswick, or those other first black drill instructors. But the training really got tougher because those men knew that they didn't trade these Marines to the best of their ability, that they were failed not only in the Marine Corps, but if they was put in a combat situation. So many of these Marines that trained at Moffat Point Camp went on to serve in the Pacific. 
at some of the battles that you see on TV and in the movies. They fought on Iwo Jima. They fought on Pele Lu. They fought on Saipan. They fought on Okinawa. And they also fought on Guam. Uh, the largest concentration of black Marines to fight in World War II took place on the Battle of Okinawa, which started 1 April 1945. But in February 1945, kind of appropriately, Black History Month, uh, February 19th, when the Marines landed on Iwo Jima, Marines of the 8th Ammo Company and 36th Depo Company went aboard on D-Day in that first wave. And a few other Moffa Point uh, companies followed on in the coming days. So they fought on Iwo Jima. They were decorated for valor. They were decorated for um, being injured with the Purple Heart. Um, and they went on to fight gallantly on all the battles I just mentioned. So let's move a little bit forward now. So we're talking about after World War II, we're talking about the mid-1960s, where some of these Moffa Pointers now have been out the Marine Corps for about 20 years. So a group of these enterprising gentlemen in Philadelphia were kind of wondering where the old gang was. Uh, so they got together, people like Cecil B. Moore. You may know that name, Cecil B. Moore, as a, a powerful activist and NAACP leader in Philadelphia. We know him as a sergeant major and as a Moffa Point Marine. Well, he got together with a gentleman named Brooks Gray, who retired as a master gunnery sergeant, and they sent out telegrams. You got to remember, this is 1965, so there's no internet. Uh, there's no cell phones. A long distance call will cost you an arm and a leg. So they used Cecil B. Moore's office on North Broad Street in Philadelphia to get the word out. And this word went out to most of the African press, the Chicago Defender, uh, the, the Philadelphia Tribune and other black newspapers at the time, that there was a call for a reunion at the old Adelphia Hotel in Philadelphia. Now, they had no idea who, how many would show up. Well, it turns out in September 1965, nearly 400 of these men showed up. And I've been told many times for the Marines that were there, every time the elevator opened up, hey, baby, how you been? What you been doing? And when they found out how successful many of these men were, some were doctors, some were lawyers, some were teachers, some were activists, some were businessmen, but they, most of them were very professional. So that from that first reunion, they received a charter for a veterans organization called the Moffa Point Marine Association. We now refer to it as the National Moffa Point Marine Association. And this year, 2022, we'll be celebrating our 57th year as a national association. And we're gonna meet in Shreveport, Louisiana for our national convention uh, from 12 to 16 July. If you want inf more information about this, please visit our website at www. Moffitt Point Marines with an S dot org. Well, this association, when it was started in 1965, I was only seven years old. Uh, but when I came to the Marine Corps in 1976, I developed a keen interest in who came before me. So I was mentored by some of these Moffitt Point Marines from the time I was a, a private first class up until the day I retired. And one of those mentors, one of my last mentors on active duty was no, none other than Brooks Gray, one of the founders. Uh, he had foretold that I would be national president one day when I didn't think I would. Um, but when I became national president, the Moffa Point Marines were a little jealous of the Tuskegee Airmen because they got all the press. Uh, they were the good glorified fly boys uh, and the Buffalo Soldiers who have a rich history uh, in Army and Armed Forces tradition. But the Moffa Pointers were left out. So I was challenged by one of these Moffa Point Marines to, to get them the same recognition that the Tuskegee Airmen received. And that recognition was the Congressional Gold Medal. So in 2007, while in Jacksonville, Florida, at our national convention, I happened to meet um, Tony Williams. He was a state senator at the time. And he asked me as national president, what were my goals for the association? And I was ready, I'm always ready for that question. I said, well, we want to get the Congressional Gold Medal, uh, we want a postage stamp, and we want Moffa Point Camp on the National Register of Historical Places. And Tony kind of asked me about the Congressional Gold Medal because he thought I was talking about the Medal of Honor. So once I explained to him what it was and how I was going about doing it, uh, Tony told me that I was going about it wrong. And I asked, um, I call him Tony now, Senator um, um, Tony. Um, I said, well, how should I do it? He said, well, you need to win over the Congressional Black Caucus if you want any type of national legislation to go through. And our friends were Representative Corrine Brown. So let me introduce you to her, and he did. 
and I went to Washington, D.C. for the Congressional Black Caucus in 2007 and told the Marco Point Marine story to many African-American members of Congress. At the end of our presentation, I had five Marco Pointers with me. At the end of our presentation, Kareem Brown came up to me and asked me if I had a sponsor for this legislation. I said I didn't. She said, you do now. And she said, you don't talk to anybody else because I want to be the co-sponsor or the lead sponsor of this bill. So Representative Brown and I worked together from 2007 to 2011 lobbying Congress to get this bill on the floor of the Congress. Now, if you know anything about uh, the civic process of a bill and how it becomes a law, there's 435 members of Congress. Most of the bills are passed by a majority or 218 people. But when you go for a congressional gold medal, you need a super majority or 290 co-sponsors before they're even put on the floor to vote. Well, while we was lobbying, Congress Congress turned over um, and most of the members that we had signed on to the bill, some of them didn't get reelected. I thought that we can save the ones that signed on to the bill and carry over to the next Congress. That's not how it works. Once the Congress turns over, all those bills are dead and you have to start all over again. Uh, I was starting to get discouraged. I had made 50 trips or more to Washington, D.C. to lobby, to knock on doors, to pass out information. And here we are in 2011, and I had to start really from scratch. Uh, but Kareem Brown was by my side. She was determined to get this done. She says, Joe, we're going to get this done. I'm going to stay there with you. The commandant of the Marine Corps found out what I was doing, James Amos, and he assigned his legislation team to help me lobby. He even entertained the Congressional Black Caucus at his house for a breakfast, and he put on a special parade for the Marfa Pointers in August of 2011. Well, in October 2011, October 25th, the bill came to the floor. And in five minutes, five years of work was decided. The bill passed the U.S. House Representatives 422 to zero. Now the bill has to go to the Senate. So the bill went to the Senate on November 9th, 2011, and it was passed by what they call affirmation. So affirmation means all in favor, say aye. If everybody says aye, is recorded as uh, 67 and nothing. So now that it's passed the House and the Senate, it's got to go to the president's desk for him to sign it. Well, President Barack Obama was out of town at the time. And if he's out of town, he has to sign bills in the law within a certain number of days when he comes back. So on November 23rd, 2011, President Barack Obama signed Public Law 11259 into law. That got things rolling. All of a sudden, we had to find some of these mob appointments to get them for a ceremony at the um, at the U.S. Capitol. Uh, so I personally had communication with over 800 families from January to April of 2012. And as you saw in the clip beforehand, nearly 400 showed up at Emancipation Hall within the U.S. Capitol to receive the Congressional Gold Medal. Um, everybody was congratulating me because it was an accomplishment because I actually wrote that bill uh, upstairs in my bedroom over a weekend and the Congress really didn't change my language too much. But I knew then and I know now the work had just gotten started. Out of 20,000 men who went through my appointment, they were all men. Uh, we've only awarded about 2,000 congressional gold medals. And that's been in 10 years. So what we're doing now is we're calling out and we're looking for these families or these mouth appointments. And as I mentioned earlier, Eddie Pringle has been good at doing research. He questions people, uh, wants to know, your dad served in the Marine Corps? When did he serve? And if he finds out he was an African-American and served during the time Marfa Point Camp was open, he'll pick up the phone and call me. Uh, Joe, I got one. We're working a hot one here. And uh, we have successfully awarded uh, congressional gold medals in the state of Florida because of the work of people like um, Eddie Pringle. Now, what are we doing now? What we're doing now is we've had five books in the working. Two of them have been published in the last couple of weeks. One of those books... Don't know how good this is going to come up. It's Footprints of the Marfa Point Marine. It's published by a guy named James Mosley. His dad was a Marfa Point Marine, and it's on Amazon. The other book is called To Walk on Water by Captain Eddie uh, Q. Uh, Hicks. Captain Eddie Q. Hicks uh, just published this book a couple of weeks ago. We are working on a graphic novel now that we're hoping we'll put in school systems across the whole uh, country, across these whole United States. And we're also working on a major um, um, movie, a feature film project. I've been working with a filmmaker uh, named Roger Mick Kamore for about eight or nine years. We're getting real close to maybe start filming. So the working copy of this movie 
It's called Black Boots. And uh, two things that we've done since the gold medal to memorialize these Michael Point Marines is one. Association, if you don't mind. Okay, Tony, go ahead. Roger that. So now, I, I, and then I asked you, I said, hey, Joe, so who's the Florida guy? Who's the guy in Florida that I need to be talking to? Because, you know, we're in Florida. And you, right. and you, and you pointed to George, George Gillis. Gillis. So, so George, how you doing? Uh, and, and give it. Tell us a little bit what's going on in Florida. I know we already. I mean, uh, George talked about uh, Cong Congresswoman uh, Kareem Brown, but tell us what's going on in Florida. Okay, welcome to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> chapter twenty nine of the National Market Point Marine Association is the only chapter located in Florida. Excuse me. I gotta put my cell phone on. I'm sorry. I was my cell phone. Uh, as I was saying, Chapter 29 is the only chapter in Florida of the National Malta Point Marine Association. This chapter was formed in 2007. As a matter of, oh no, I'm sorry, 2002. Uh, thank you, Joe. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Go ahead. Get it right. Get it right. 2002. Right. And we just celebrated our 20th year anniversary this past uh, weekend. But I was not a member of the chapter at that time. I believe uh, Robinowitz William, who's on the call right now, was a founding one of the founding members of Chapter 29 of the National Market Point Marine Association. Yeah. Uh, over the years, we've had at least five original Martha pointed in the chapter. However, there were several other men here in Jacksonville who served in the Martha Point Marines. But, you know, they were not members of the chapter, but they were Moffat Point Marine, and they were recognized as such. Any man that served in World War II in the Marine Corps that went through Moffat Point is a Marine and is a man that we will honor no matter how long it takes. That is what Joe has spoken to. Sure. So we are looking for these men. We are looking for their families. As a matter of fact, doing one ceremony at a church here in Florida. The family, uh, a family member, no, not the family member, the pastor came up and told me that his church secretary father was an original Martha Point Marine. So I went to her and asked her, and she said he didn't want anything to do with it. The, then eventually he passed, and she, you know the family still didn't want to you know get involved. I don't know why. Maybe um, I should have pressed it a little harder. But there's still time, Joe, if I, you know, if I'm allowed to go back and see if I can press that woman, that lady, to, you know, so that we can honor her father. Because, you know, like, it's, they all need to be honored because these were our heroes. These were the Marine Corps heroes of World War II, really. Like I said, now I have four in the chapter. Okay. One of us uh, is, uh, he joined us, he's down there south near Tampa, near, uh, with uh, Robinowitz, uh, he moved from the north. He moved from uh, chapter uh, three, I think it was, Joe, New York. To Alan Williams? That is Mr. Uh, Charles Oscar Foreman. He oh, yeah, Florida Charles now. Foreman, yes. Yes, and he's, you know, he's still active. He's still, you know, he wants to yes. stay involved. And he, so we involved him in our chapter, you know, and we keep him up to date. And, uh, Mr. Williams, Robinowitz Williams, he goes by to check on him, make sure he's doing okay. Thank you. And I think we have another member moving here, Joe, from uh, Georgia. This man is well known. Ambassador um, Theodore Britton. I talked to him this right. morning. I think he's moving here to Florida. Yes, I he is. I think they bought a beach house on uh, yep. on uh, what was the name of that island? Uh, not the island, but uh, the community it was a black community. It was a the first uh, black American Beach. Okay. American Beach. It was the first black community owned beach in Florida. American Beach. So that's where he is intending to uh, move to American Beach. So I have to get in touch with him again. Because uh, Senator Tony Hill, former Senator, took me to, uh, well, I'd already met uh, the ambassador through our conventions and other uh, events. But uh, I have to get back in touch with him and see how he's doing and see if he, you know, because we haven't had a, uh, I'm going to say haven't had any 
over the past uh, couple of months since last November. I think we've had two or three, two, two members, two actual face-to-face -face meetings. And the last weekend was the uh, last one when we celebrated our chapter anniversary. But as I said, we're the only chapter in Florida, and we still, you know, search out and look for uh, the families and the original Moffat Pointers, because as you know, most of them are anywhere above 95. Right. I would say above 95. Right. And the three, the four in my chapter here are 97, 96, two are 96, 97. And Mr. Foreman, I'm, I can't think of his age or can't remember his age group or age as far as, but I'm quite sure it's in the 90s. Yeah, so yeah, it's like like the World War II guys and the tough y'all so, yeah, like, guys aging out. Oh, excuse me. Can I take a pause there for a second? I got to take this pause. It's very important. I'm sorry. No problem. So, so now, and we, and we now we're going to get down to Rabinowitz because we mentioned about, he mentioned earlier that you, um, you were the one that found it chapter 29 and now, now mr robinowitz robin or robinowitz you're you're here in the tampa area right hillsborough area that is correct yeah okay. give us kind of the, what, the you know how you started hey i'm going to find you know i'm going to form a chapter 29 and what's going on with that and then we'll talk about uh, mr foreman as well okay uh well my name is robinowitz d williams um I'm originally from florida um i ended up getting stationed at blunt island um back in like 98. Uh, I was stationed there with uh, then Master Gunnery Sergeant Hobson Bethune, the grandson of Mary Margaret Bethune. Um, and there were two Marines, but he's, he's a twin and both him and his brother were both in the Marine Corps. And I was honored to serve with both of them. Uh, and, and that is where I really found out about the Monkey Point Marines. It was introduced to me by Master Gunnery Sergeant Hobson Bethune. Uh, it was Master Gunner Sergeant Hassan Bethune, uh, Ron Jackson, uh, Kenneth Cooper, myself, and, and, and about five or six others. I, I can't remember all the names. We actually started Chapter 29 and brought that uh, forward, uh, as indicated in 2002. I was an active duty member at the time, and I had to uh, go ahead and accept some orders. I did move on throughout my career, but after doing my 26 years, I came back home to Florida and I was able to reunite with my former chapter and just happy to be there. So I really commute the, the, the whole state. I'll go to Jacksonville once a quarter. I'll check with uh, Charles Foreman and maybe have lunch with him from time to time. And I'll tell a, a similar story as uh, George was telling. A lot of members, because of the training and because of the time, did not want to be recognized. I myself personally have an uncle, Willie Andrew Schofield, my dad's brother. My dad went Army. He went Marine in um, 1942, 43. So he's actually a, a Monfort Point Marine, and he did not want to have anything to do with it. He refused it, and his daughters honored that, and he's no longer with us. And I've just recently reminded them of keeping the legacy alive. So... I have my cousin who's going to promise me to provide the social and everything else. And we're going to add one more member for that congressional gold medal. Okay. We're, we're currently with one um, chapter in, in the state of Florida, but I've been at it for quite some time trying to get it together. I'm still a young man that's employed, so it's a little difficult. But if I can get one started, I can get two. And before it's said and done, we will have a chapter here in the Tampa Bay area to cover all of Hillsborough and Pinellas. Uh, that is my goal. That is my intent. It shall happen. Um, but that's kind of what really brought forth um, the, the chapter to Florida when we did that in Jacksonville. And I work with George Gillis uh, quite often to uh, do whatever it takes. I currently serve as the Veterans, Veterans Affairs Officer and I'm the treasurer. Uh, mainly the Veterans Affairs guy, because I actually work for the Department of Veterans Affairs. So I have a lot of knowledge to pass on to veterans, both about the benefits and about home loan programs. And that's kind of where I come from, Tony. Well, and, I, and that's great. And I want to I want to uh, turn to, to Eddie, because Eddie's been, like, as uh, Joe was always saying, Eddie's been a, a big, big key character over here. And we want to help you out. 
as best we can. I mean, you know, uh, you know, the the, the field the field is plenty, the laborers are few. So, but if we get yeah. a couple of us, we can make the, we can make that happen. But Eddie, if you will, just tell us kind of what what you've been doing trying to get this thing going. I mean, I already heard your name from from Joe and everybody else. So give us kind of what the kind of what action you've been doing, the call to action you've been doing to try to get this thing uh, ha- happening here in uh, Hillsborough and Pinellas. Well, to me, it means a lot because as a young boy, I guess I probably was first and second grade, I ran errands for a lady across the street. <clears throat> and her son had served in the Marines and he had his picture there. And every time I go in to run an errand, I would see his picture. And he was an upstanding guy. He always had him a nice car. In fact, he worked at the Albany Marine Base in Albany, Georgia. He retired from that base. And every time I go home to my hometown, which is Moultrie, Georgia, for some unknown reason, I always drive up to that base. And I, I guess I travel the same road he traveled. And it, it gives me a, a special feeling. That's that's how I, I feel about the Marine Corps. I, I actually grew up in the Marine Corps. I went in when I was 17. And while serving at Kason with uh, 326, my sergeant major, who I didn't even know, was a, a Marvel Point Marine. I didn't know it until I went to my hometown, and me and Mr. Raymond Jenkins, the guy that who lived across the street from me, I bought him a, 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 a movie and showed him the movie about K Son. And he saw Agra Smith there. He said, Oh man, I know him. I've been knowing him a long time. And then he told me he knew Sergeant Major Huh when he was a corporal. So I used to go home and, and, and drink with him, and we talk about the Marine Corps and, and politics. We'd sit on the front porch and have a couple of drinks and talk about the Marine Corps and politics. So I really, um, you know, kind of grew up with these guys. Right here in St. Petersburg, the first, we got three right off the bat when they first passed the bill. We got um, a school teacher friend of mine, Mr. Uh, Blossom, who, I, once again, I ran errands for him. I mean, once he found out I was a Marine and he was a Marine, he got old and he would call me up on the phone and I'd come by his house and run errands for him as an adult. And then we had another guy that went to church with me was Mr. Ayers. He didn't even know that he was a Marfa Point Marine. He he said, I was in the Marines and I was stationed at Camp Lejeune. So I I asked him, what years was you there? I said, man, you're a Marfa Point Marine. I said, let's get the paperwork and get it started. So we got him his his medal too. But some guys probably wasn't aware that they was actually Marshall Point Marines because he was one of them. <clears throat> and he's another good friend. We used to, you know, I go by his house, even though he was an old guy. We have a couple of drinks and talk talk about World War II and what he saw. And all the guys told me this in the book. I read the book about the Marvel Point Marines. The book says that they police them, them up their own selves. But the guys, if you talk with them, they told the guys, they say, if you try to get escape and you don't pass, the, you know, don't get out of here like you're supposed to, we're going to kill you out of mm. So that, I think, instilled some guys to go ahead and do it because they know they could do it. It's just a, a matter of mind over matter. It's not, I wouldn't say it's not a big deal, but you could do it. I mean, if you go to Paris Island, you're going to do it. I mean, the drill instructor is going to make sure you do it, and you're not going to want to get set back. You don't want to be set back not two days. You don't want to be at Paris Island not two days longer than you have to. So you're going to get your mind straight and get your body to move it and go ahead on and do it. So I admire those guys that went to Marble Point because they had it a lot harder than we did. They not only had boot camp. But they was dealing with extreme racism. They didn't even want them there. They wanted to see them fail. So that's why I'm that's why I'm committed to making sure every man that deserves that congressional medal, I'm gonna work hard and get it done. I started to say buzz my balls, but I'm gonna get it done, man, because their family deserve it. They ask a lot of those people. So that's all I do. I don't I'm not, I don't want to hold no office because I hold some other offices. And you guys probably know 
up there in Jacksonville know Dr. E.L. Norman. He's a, he's a 33rd degree Mason. And when I go to uh, Jacksonville, I guess he don't get around much now. We used to eat at the banquet together. He's a preacher up there. He's a great yes. guy. And I respect those guys. He must be past. He must be in about 95 or more. Dr. Dr. Norman is 96 years of age. Wow. And the yeah. next time you come to Jacksonville, please go by to see him. Please come go to his house or I'll take you there because he has lost his eyesight. Wow. He's he lost his eyesight? Like, yeah, and his wife has passed over the few I'm years okay. ago. So please, right. the next time you come to Jacksonville. Yeah, in fact, I'll, I'll be sure in Jacksonville probably sometime on March 26th for another event. Um, and this is why, why this is why we having this from you know Black Black Christian Month because oftentimes people don't really you don't see it publicized as much as what we do as veterans, African American veterans in the military for whatever reason. And we like we mentioned, we got the Buffalo Soldiers, we got the Tuskegee Airmen, we have the um, the um, Muffet Point Marines, you know that, that again during that time when it was segregation was legal and all that kind of stuff. And that's something that we need to know, and and not just us as African American community, but the entire the entire veteran community. To know that we hate it. So that's why we're having this, this this particular conversation. Joe, I want to circle back around because I, I definitely heard a lot of call to actions about identifying um you know through families or something, families who have who have uh people who may be uh, part of Mar Marfa Point Marines. So I want to circle back around to where you had so and what events are they coming again? You had mentioned about the uh the national convention. Any events coming up um within the next year? Well for, as, from, from the next. national level <clears throat> Uh, we have our National Spring Council, uh, which would be in April in Shreveport. And that's kind of a workup to the National Convention. It gets us used to the hotel, the staff, the logistics. Uh, but from a local level, most chapters have what we call a signature event. In other words, they put on pretty much the same event the same month every year. They try to spread it out through the year and not just do it at, in November for the Marine Corps birthday of Veterans Day. So there are a few signature events coming up in Philadelphia, we do do ours in November. Uh, Atlanta does theirs in October. Um, and many chapters, Chronicle 32 does theirs in August to commemorate the opening of Moffat Point Camp. Um, so I would encourage your listeners to go to our webpage again, www.moffatpointmarines.org. And the webpage is divided into two sections. One is for the public, which you can see a lot of information about Moffat Point. And then one side is for the members where they have to log on and they can see reports of that nature. But I would say Google Marple Point and go on our website and we keep that webpage pretty up to date and you'll find out what we're doing throughout the year. Now, what do I, what do I, how, how can I be a member? What does it take to be a member of the, of the uh, association? That's a good question. That's a great question because a lot of folks, and I was one of them, I thought when I was a young Marine, you had to be a Marple Pointer because most of the members were Marple Pointers. But our bylaws state that any member of any armed forces that served for 90 days and received an honorable dis a discharge could be a Muffle Point Marine Association member. I have members in my chapter from the Army, from the Navy, and the Air Force. Uh, so we accept everybody in our chat. This is a rich history, and we accept anybody. So all you have to do, you can do that online, again, our website, become a new member, and it'll walk you through it. I want to show you guys real quick here. Ah, oh, this, wow. This is impressive thing here. We got a lot of people in there. And I see women in there. I see all kinds of people in there. So that picture was taken in 2004 uh, at our convention there. The reason why you see so many Marvel pointers in that picture is a past national president, Dr. Herman Rett, unveiled his book, Final Roll Call. And we thought that was going to be the last great gathering of Marvel pointers, but we were wrong. Uh, eight years later, we have 400 in the Capitol. But that's a beautiful picture. I love that picture. Okay, so that means I could be a Muffin Point Marine. Yes, you can. Absolutely. And, and it's not stolen Absolutely. valor. And I tell you what, uh, and folks know me, Eddie Pringle belongs to the Philadelphia chapter. I've got members in Chicago, California, uh, because I tell folks, if your chapter's not taking care of you, I will. <laughs> so, hey, George, George, you better watch this guy. He sounds like he's stealing people. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was a recruiter in the Court. So Don't worry. Pringle Pringle go go <laughs> All right. So in closing, I really, and I really appreciate how you guys taking time out here to talk about the month of Port Marines. And in closing, I want each one of you guys to say something, you know, just uh, either call to action or whatever 
as we go around the horn. And we'll start out with the former national president, Joe Geter, and then we'll go to George. Any last words? Okay, well, thank you. Again, thank you, Tony, for the opportunity to talk to your audience about the Muffin Point Marines. And I will say to anybody listening to quiz your family. Uh, there may be a Muffin Point Marine in your family. You heard one of the panelists say uh, that they was at a church and they was approached. It's rare that I'm not speaking at an event and afterwards somebody comes up to me and say, I think my uncle was a Muffin Point Marine. Well, I think my grandfather was. So ask your family. And even if they weren't a Muffin Point Marine, get their story on film. Uh, you will be grateful for it and your family will be grateful for it. Thank you so much, Tony. Thanks, Joe. And you, George, any last, any last words before we leave? I want to say thank you very much. Tony, also for this uh, time and effort to uh, recognize the original Mount Perform Marines and the National Mount Perform Marine Association. I would just like to name the men, the original Mount Perform Marines here in my chapter. And one has already been mentioned, Dr. Edward I. Norman, Reverend Dr. Edward I. Norman, Mr. Alpha Gaines, Mr. George Neck Ivory. These are men that are still active and still within talking and listening to about the Martha Point Marines. So thank you very much, Tony. I hope we can do this again. Thanks, George. I appreciate it. And the guy with my last name, but the first name, I don't know where he got it from. <laughs> Rabinowitz <laughs> Williams. Go on, I'll give us the last bit of part yes, of Yes, sir. That Rabinowitz is Jewish, and it came from a Jewish freedom fighter, fighter who marched with Dr. King right there in Albany, Georgia there, uh, Mr. Pringle. So that's how I got my first name. But I'll just put the Bay Area on notice that it's time. It's time for me to get my family uh, on board with honoring my uncle. It's time for us to get together as Marines, sailors, soldiers, airmen in this area and, and create an organization that honor the history of those that came before us. So um, that's really what I'm, uh, I'm, I'm thankful for. And I thank you, Tony, for bringing this up and letting us share what you're doing Black History Month. All right, we heard it. So he said it's time. We heard that. And last but not least, Mr. Eddie Pringle, the reason why we're here. Any last words before we, we shut this down there, Eddie? Well, I'm glad Mr. Uh, Williams mentioned the fact that something about all in Georgia, because that's what Mr. Jenkins worked at. And once we get him his congressional medal, then I'm going to try to take it to another level and maybe get the street. <laughs> On, on the base, they're named after him. I'm sure that they would want to do that once we get, I get that congressional medal for him. Because he deserved it. He was a very proud Marine. He was proud of his service. And most of those guys, in fact, all of them, he was very proud of being a Marine. A lot more proud than some of the guys that's walking today the because they really did accomplish something. And one thing before we leave, also I want to just bring up, reminding me that uh, Joe is also trying to work on a congressional gold medal for the, uh, the 6888 Postal. Yes, and oh, I'm glad you brought that up. They reached just last week 294 co-sponsors. It's already been passed by the Senate. We're just waiting to go to the floor for the House. Colonel Edna Cummins has done a phenomenal job. I've been on our hip for a couple of years, and I'm excited. We're real close. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I guess. Yes, sir. Yes, George, you got something to say? Yes, I would like to ask Joe one question. Uh, the co-sponsor, one of the leading co-sponsors for the uh, Congressional Gold Medal for, uh, you know, that worked with uh, Congresswoman Corrine Brown. Uh, could you name her? I think there was a co-sponsor that worked closely with her out of North Carolina. Uh, I don't know. She was the lead in the Senate. You're speaking of Senator, the late Senator Kay Hagan. Uh, so uh, Kareem Brown was the main sponsor in the House. Kay Hagan uh, took over uh, as a, the lead sponsor in the Senate. And I thank God for Kay Hagan because she kept that Senate on the floor November 9th until they voted on this bill. So Kay Hagan, may she rest in peace. That's great to hear. Hopefully one day, Joe, I'll have you, I'll have you, you you're in the back and we can find out that that uh, the postal unit got their progressive Hope gold medal. Hopefully very soon. Thank you, Tony. Roger that. Okay, so thank you guys. Thank you guys very much. So there you have it. I hope you guys learned learned about a history you have not heard much about the Mumford Point Marines. And you talked about from 1942 where they had separate barracks that were called the Mumford Point where they had to go through all the discrimination and 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 had great valor. So you may not have heard about it, but now you need to look them up. Now you can't say you haven't heard about them because you heard them about right here. We had a couple of call to actions. One, find out. 
if, if maybe somebody, one of your relatives may be a Marvel Point Marine. Ask them, talk to them, find out. And if you have, if you do find out about it, talk to one of our guys you saw on our show here or anybody else so we can get that guy, that guy his congressional gold medal. He earned it. Do it. So that's a one of our call to action. Another call to action? We're going to have a chapter here in Hillsborough. <laughs> okay. All right. You heard it. You heard it. Mr. Obinowitz we'll talk about it. It's our turn to try to make that happen. I can't see why it can't happen. So, but, so let's make sure that's one of our call to actions. So that end, you heard, hope you learned a lot about the Muffle Report Marines. For those you didn't know about it, you know about it now. Uh, look them up, Google. Uh, Joe gave the, the uh, website. I'll make sure I'll put it on my plug when I put it on here. And until then, this is Tony Williams from Black History Month, and we just had a great discussion on the Muffle Point Marines. Until then. Oh, 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 oh